The um, next 40-day book that will be coming out this year uh, is on the Ten Commandments. I felt convicted by God to, to write the book on that. And I did a little research, of course, to come up with that. And I got to thinking, well, it might be nice to share some of those thoughts with our, us here at our congregation. And I've been giving you some introductory sermons on the Ten Commandments. And today, I was going to begin with the First Commandment. But last Saturday night, usually after I have the Sabbath service, Saturday night, or for sure Sunday morning, I start reflecting on, Lord, what do you want next time? And I thought he wanted the first commandment today, but as I reflected on it, prayed about it, he said, no, he wants us to give some thought to why we keep the commandments. Oh, that makes sense. So uh, I just want to talk about today is really the most important factor when it comes to our obedience to God's Ten Commandments. Jesus pointed that out when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Very simple little verse, but that truly is the primary motive for obedience to God, for obedience to God's commandments is love. If we are living during the time of trouble, and it's very possible, some of us will be, the way things are happening in the world. If we are living during the time of trouble, I can guarantee you, we will not be faithful to a law because the law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We will only be faithful to a God who we know loves us And we love him in return. And he asks us to keep the seventh day that he created at creation holy. It is love that will get us through to the end. That will enable us to be faithful to God. Because as we know from prophecy, that's going to be a challenging time. Now, an example of this motive of love and relationship. For, for instance, David, when we read about David's prayer of repentance, you remember he committed the sin of adultery, then the sin of murder. I don't know what was going on in him totally. He didn't deal with it initially, but God sent a prophet to him, Nathan, and he drew his attention to David, what he had done. And the Holy Spirit took that and brought deep conviction to his heart. And I find it very enlightening to get an insight on what really concerned David when he realized the magnitude of his sin. And when you read in Psalm 51, his prayer of repentance, he says, against you, you only, God, have I sinned. The number one concern of David in his prayer of repentance is what his sin did to his relationship with God. It wasn't, oh no, I'm not gonna go to heaven. Or, oh no, I won't have eternal life. Now, those are factors, of course. But the number one concern David had was, oh, my Lord, my God, I am so sorry for what I have done to you and to our relationship. Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me, Lord, to the joy of your salvation. Restore my relationship with you. In that prayer of repentance, we get the insight that the number one motive in his repentance was his concern for his relationship with God. And that's where God wants to take all of us, is to draw us into a very close, intimate relationship, a love relationship with himself. You see, Christianity is kind of unique. Christianity is a relationship with a person. Now, Christianity has doctrines, yes, but it's not primarily accepting of doctrines, though that's a part of it. Christianity is primarily a relationship with a person, and that person is God himself and in the person of Jesus Christ. Knowing God loves us, which is my focus today knowing God loves us is at the very heart of our relationship with God and the more we know that 
in our heart, the stronger our relationship with God will be. When you think about prayer, sometimes we think, well, when we pray, we claim a promise. And we tend to focus on the promise. However, primarily, prayer is not simply the trust and a promise, it's a trust in the person. In the person, in God Himself, because He's the one that made the promise. And if we know Him and have the loving relationship with Him, then it puts our prayer life in a much different realm than simply claiming a written promise in the Word. It is actually trusting the person, knowing the person, God Himself, behind the promise. And that again has to do with relationship. Now for most of us, and I know this has been my experience through the years as I started coming to understand these things, I'll say at least for many of us, it's been my case, our knowledge of God's love for us is intellectual, though we may not know that. And it took me a while to realize that. And every time I preach, as I said before, I'm speaking to myself, and this certainly applies in this sermon, because I'm still growing in this, to know deep in my heart God loves me. Because if you would have asked me years ago and say, does God love you? I would have said yes. And if somebody who didn't know much about Christianity asked me why, why do you know that? I'd say, well, Jesus came to this world. He suffered, he died for me. He died for my sins. He gives me eternal life. Those are all facts about God and what he did. Knowing those things do not necessarily mean that we know God loves us in our heart. We may know it intellectually, but God wants it to move from the intellect to the heart, deeper within our life, a knowledge of his love for us. <clears throat> and I really believe one of the greatest tragedies in Christianity, and that doesn't mean we're lost, but we miss so much, is that for many Christians, we don't know deep in our heart how much God truly loves us. And all we have to do is look at our life's worries and anxieties and fears, and the more of those we have, those are indications we don't quite know God and his love for us as he wants us to. Doesn't mean we're lost. It just means we're not having the journey in life that God would like for us to have. Now, once we know in our heart God loves us, of course, our relationship with him will become deeper, broader, <laughs> so much more meaningful, and our joy in the Lord will be exceeding as well. Now, Paul knew this, of course. God had revealed this to him. In our scripture this morning, Paul kind of shares with us what his prayer was for the Christians in Ephesus. It's kind of interesting when you read Paul's writings, you can get insights of what he prayed for, for those he was, who he was writing to. And notice what he said here. It was read for our scripture. That he would grant you, this is Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now there's to be filled with the spirit. In Ephesians, Paul commands us actually, keep on being filled with the spirit. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's how Christ lives most fully in us, is through the baptism of the spirit that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You see what he's saying here is that I'm praying for you folks in Ephesus that you will come to know 
the full height, breadth, depth. I mean, he's trying to say all of it, that you will know, not just in your head, but in your heart, in your deepest inner being, you will know the love of Christ for you. That was his prayer. And he said, the reason that's important also, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The more we know God loves us, the more of him we will experience in every aspect of our life. And that's why he finishes that particular section with that. So we find this principle uh, laid out in John. Again, he quoted Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, when we know in our heart that God loves us, our relationship will be deeper, more meaningful. Our obedience to God will be based on love, not because the law says do it. We obey because we love God who loves us, and we want to please him, the love motive. John pointed out this principle, and I, I found it fascinating. It was a number of years ago that I first saw this. It is an important principle on this subject. 1 John 4.19. Very simple verse. We love him because he first loved us. Now, I'm going to share a little more on this later, but I, I was adopted at six months. I met my, my birth mother and father once, birth mother numerous times. The parents that I loved were the Smiths. Why was that? Because they loved me. And as I grew up and was experiencing their love, my love for them would grow also. When I met my birth mother, was there a bond of love there? No. There was an intellectual understanding. She's my mother. But the love was with the Smiths who raised me. That's what it means we love God because he first loved us. You see, we can only love God in return to the degree that we know he loves us. That's the principle. That's why it's important that Paul prayed, that we would know, rather than just head knowledge, but deep in our heart, God's love for us then we can love him in return. And what does that mean also in obedience? We can only obey God in love to the degree that we know he loves us. It's all tight. It begins on this level. And then it works out in this level with one another. And what does knowing God's love for us do? Wonderful little verse in 1 John again, verse 18. There is no fear in love. If we, again, this doesn't mean we're lost, but if we are going through something right now and we are fearful, it may be a health issue, it may be a financial issue, a family issue, whatever it is. If we go through situations in life and we are fearful, that is a barometer, an indicator that we don't know the love of God like he wants us to. Because it says here, there is no fear in love. If we truly know in our heart that God loves us, there's nothing Satan can do to us to cause us to be fearful or to worry or to be anxious. Why? Because we know God loves us. You see that in a little child. Something happens that makes a little child fearful, they run to mommy or daddy, and they're not afraid anymore. Well, we run to God. We don't have to be afraid of anything because <laughs> that's what he says here. Love, he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. We know that one, don't we? He that fears not made perfect in love. So the more we know God loves us, it's going to alleviate stress, worry, anxiety. Boy, how great that would be. You see, we weren't created to live in a world of fear and stress and anxiety. You were created to live in the Garden of Eden. Now, this is no Garden of Eden. So God, because we had to be driven out of there, he says, well, I'm still not going to forget him. I'm going to help him out. And he's made it possible, though, even though we live out of the Garden of Eden, to still have joy, peace, not the anxiety, because... 
again, as, as we look at the fruit of the Spirit, love is the first fruit, joy, peace. You see, the more we know God loves us, that's why he loves us at first, the more we know God loves us, the more peace we'll have. The more we know God loves us, the more joy we have. The more we know God loves us, the more faith we have. That's why I said when we pray, we are praying to a person and claiming what that person, God, has promised to do for us. First is the person, and we're looking at the promise. And so the more we know that person, God, loves us, we have faith. We trust him. We believe what he says that he's going to do. Now, Satan knows all this. He's been studying humanity for thousands of years. He understands this stuff. And of course, does he want you to know God loves you? No. So he'll do what he can to keep that from happening. And what he does, he allows things and tries to bring things in our life to create emotional wounds that get in the way of us knowing that God loves us. Here's how this works. As a child, especially in childhood or as an adult, we experience hurts, deep hurts, conditional love, conditional acceptance. We experience abuse, maybe physical, maybe emotional. You're stupid, you're no good, you're never going to amount to anything, that kind of thing. You never go to college, you never achieve anything, you never graduate. That's emotional abuse, sexual abuse, religious abuse. The Bible says this, Ellen White says that, you do that because I said so, that's religious abuse. And what these things do, this abuse, these cause deep-seated feelings of worthlessness and shame. It's inside. Now, you don't know that's going on, but that's what's taking place inside us. Well, we want to naturally protect ourselves from that. That's logical. It's a natural response. We want to protect ourselves from these feelings, and we develop certain behaviors and feelings to protect ourselves. One thing we do, we put a shell around ourselves. So I don't want to get too close to you. I don't want to get too close to Lonnie. He may hurt me. Or Ike, you know? So I got a little shell here. We protect ourselves. Now, if we keep that there, we will never have a really close, meaningful relationship with anyone. Now, again, it doesn't mean we're lost, but we're going to miss out on some of the greatest joys of life. We were created to interreact, interrelate in a healthy way with one another. But we put a shell around ourselves. Well, something else happens. When we have that shell around ourselves to protect ourselves from one another, it also keeps us from experiencing God's love in our life. Just like it would keep me from experiencing Ike's relationship with me and a, and a loving Christian relationship. If I have the shell, I can't, get, I can't get that from Ike. Neither can I get it from God. That shell blocks that. Now Satan knows that. Now here I ran across these a number of years ago. Here's a list of self- protecting behaviors when we've been hurt and we feel worthless. As I read through these the first time, I thought, okay, yeah, there's some stuff here. Anger when circumstances seem out of our control. Have you ever met controlling people? That's what it's all about. They're trying to protect themselves from further hurt. Fear of emotion. Fear of experiencing feelings are getting out of control. Difficulty saying no to people. Fear of trying new things, fear of failure. Frequent depression. Compulsive sins, addictive habits such as drugs, alcohol, eating disorders, pornography. Need to succeed to be accepted. These are some protective behaviors and attitudes we develop to protect ourselves because we've been hurt. Or we may develop some independent, self-sufficient behaviors to protect ourselves. Isolation and difficulty making close friends. Avoid getting into a position of need or dependence on anyone. 
great difficulty asking for a favor or help. Being a much better giver than a receiver. Sounds almost Christian, doesn't it? When we receive, we feel the need to repay immediately. Fearful or uncomfortable in a small group without being either the controlling leader or withdraw and not participate. Feel tolerated rather than accepted. I know as I read down through those, yeah, there's a few that have applied, and there's still a few that apply. Like I say, I'm not where I want to be yet. Praise God, I got some insights so of maybe by his grace to, to grow in this. Now, as human beings, we try to relieve this pain of these emotional wounds in a couple ways. One, through the flesh. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, anger, critical spirit. That's what the folks are trying to do that are into those things. They're trying to relieve the pain. It doesn't work. Then they might try religion, legalism. Oh, if I can just perfectly obey God, then I can finally have peace. It doesn't work either, of course. Instead, these develop problems spiritually, emotionally, physically. And I've seen some individuals, and I'm sure you have too, maybe they were raised in the church, they went out, and they really went out in the world. They went out and did it all. But, they, you know, it wasn't really all they wanted out there, and they come back in, and when they come in, they come in really strict. That's what's happening. They've tried the flesh. They're trying religion. You can see the pendulum, one way or the other. And, of course, neither works. We have it backwards. We think that if we can really finally overcome our faults, our sins, and our failures, then we'll be accepted by God, and we'll have peace. That's wrong. No. The truth is, <laughs> when we have peace through knowing God loves us unconditionally, then we can begin overcoming our faults and our shortcomings. Again, there you see it again. Love. Knowing God loves us is at the heart of everything. In our relationship with God, in our growth, in the Lord, everything. Now, these wounds, the next question is, okay, here's the wounds. Here's what we've, we've all had these, by the way. We all have them. We don't live in a perfect world. And we've all been wounded. What's the solution? They can be healed in only one way. Experience God's unconditional love. Love is the greatest environment for healing. That's the greatest environment to be healed of whatever we're struggling with. Jesus had two very important things in his life. When you read about his baptism in Luke chapter 3, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. He had two things. He had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came down. He was filled. He was anointed. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And number two, he knew his Father loved and accepted him. We need those same two things. We need, that's why Paul says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit every day. And we need to know that our Heavenly Father loves and accepts us. Now, how can we experience this then? Kind of breaking it down a little further. Well, as I've said, you hear me talk about a lot, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can claim that promise every day, and we should, because it says in Romans 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, that's how we have the fruit of the Spirit, is to be filled with the Spirit. And again, that first fruit is love. It's only by the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we'll truly begin experiencing the love of God. Love, and the more love we know, the more joy and peace and faith we'll have. They all go together. There's something else. 
2 Corinthians 10, what I call listening prayer. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not of this world, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, these emotional wounds we have that's keeping us from experiencing God's love for us are strongholds that Satan has put in our life. God has made it possible <laughs> that these strongholds can be pulled down. That's what it says here. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When I first came across this, everything I share with you it's either first-hand experience or experience of someone I know and trust that it's true first-hand with them. And uh, when I first came across this principle, I thought, okay, I'll try it. So I began praying, Lord, I'm asking you, I, I, I know I don't know that you love me like you want me to know that. I got quite a ways to go there. I know I'm saved. I know I have eternal life through Jesus, but I want more. <laughs> I want a really intimate relationship with you, knowing your love for me. So I began praying and asking, God, I ask that you reveal, the, uh, reveal these strongholds to me. What he'll do, he'll reveal to you past hurtful experiences. Reveal these to me that have caused these wounds that are keeping me from experiencing your love and I ask you to remove them. And then, when he does reveal those to you, then it's important we forgive those who have hurt us. Well, I had prayed that, and I shared a little bit of this at one time in one setting with some of you. I'm going to share it a little more again today because it's, it fits. I prayed that on several occasions, but not all the time. You never know when God's going to answer a prayer. I was praying one day, but not on this. I was praying on something else. And all of a sudden, God started talking to me. Not in an audible voice, but you know, he was talking to me. And he said, Dennis, when the Smiths brought you into their home, they brought you in with the attitude, as long as you lived up to the Smith standard, you would be accepted. Now, I'd never thought those thoughts before. What I'm going to share with you is in no way demeaning my parent. I thank the Lord for the parents I had. <laughs> I really do. I had a great father, a great mother. Uh, I appreciate so much what they gave me growing up. But they weren't perfect. And, and God revealed this to me, and I'd never seen this. He said, when they brought you in, this, you know, they brought you in, because they were a very proud family. And... Um, they brought you in with the understanding, as long as you lived up to the Smith standard, you'd be accepted. Then I started thinking a little bit of some things. Um, I remember when I was little, and maybe this was an expression of their generation, they'd say, if you don't behave yourself, we're going to give you back to the Indians. Now, <laughs> I'm a little guy, and I <laughs> picture some tribe off somewhere. <laughs> now, I didn't know I was adopted, because I didn't know I was adopted until I was 23. And then they would say, you know what they do to bad boys? They put them in reform school and they beat them. Well, I didn't want that. I was always a pretty good kid. Now, after, when God told me that, these things came to mind. And I began realizing that's conditional love. That's conditional acceptance. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but God brought it to my mind. And I remember some other things. And when God brought that to my mind, there were tears. You see, these emotional wounds, they're a real wound in your heart. When, my, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I've shared this with you before, my parents rejected me as a son. They took all the pictures down. That went on for a couple years, and it finally settled down. I never shed a tear over that. Not one. You see, us guys live in the head a lot, not the heart. So, you know, you deal with it up there and you let it go. 
But when God revealed that to me, remember, I had prayed for God to cast down any stronghold that was keeping me from knowing he loved me. Well, he's starting to answer that prayer. He took me to that wound. It was opened up. And I wept for the first time. There were tears. And I knew what I had to do. Now, they're both deceased by that time. But I, I said, Father, I forgive them. And I ask you to forgive them and bless them. That's how it's healed. And then God said, but Dennis, I loved you unconditionally all through that time. That brought me to tears too. You see, that's what God will do when you pray this prayer. Now, he's gentle. I know, I've known people through the years that are afraid to go to those places. It's so painful. But God is gentle. He's a gentle Savior. And when he feels it's time and you're ready, he will take you there. And I can guarantee you, if you pray this prayer, he will hear it and he will answer it. And since then, several other things have come to mind, and I won't go into detail, but several other experiences through the years have come to my mind on things that happened, not just with my parents, but in other settings that I didn't shed a tear, put on the back shelf. But when he brought it to me, there were tears many years later, and I forgave those that did whatever they did. That's the healing process. And when those wounds are being healed, that shell is starting to come down. And God's love can start coming in. There's also what I call the prayer of forgiveness. And I've prayed this really in many countries around the world. You know, I, I don't care what nationality, what color you are, we're all the same. Red, yellow, black, or white. I guess telling the boys and girls, God loves all of us. He's got a purpose. Everywhere I've gone in the world, we've all got the same issues, the same wounds, and so forth. And I've prayed this prayer of forgiveness with uh, individuals and sometimes groups, many places. And, I, and I've seen, again, it has to do with forgiving those who have hurt us on this subject here. Forgive. And it's actually a process. And in that prayer of forgiveness, you know, I pray for the Baptist Holy Spirit, claim the fruit of the Spirit, ask Jesus to manifest his forgiveness. Remember, I've shared that with you many times. If someone's hurt you, ask Jesus to give you his forgiveness. And I pray for that and that. And by the way, you know, we have power over Satan. Jesus said that. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. When the 70, they came back, they said, Lord, we can't believe it. The demons are subject to us in your name. You've got authority in Jesus to rebuke any demon. So in this prayer, I command the spirit of anger, bitterness, unforgiving spirit to part. And I have the person say that, Father, forgive me for my anger, bitterness, unforgiving spirit. And then I have them say, I forgive. And list by name or relationship those that God brings to their mind that's hurt them. I don't want to hear the details. And I tell them, if, if, if someone just flashes in your mind, you think, oh, that's insignificant. It's not insignificant. If God brought it to your mind, it's important. Forgive them. So they say that. I forgive. And then they say, and Father, I ask you to forgive those who have forgiven, and I ask you to bless them. You see, here's the principle. Paul said, be angry, sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And the next verse says, and don't give place to the devil. When we hang on to anger, and we don't know we are, when we've been deeply wounded by this abuse in the past, there's anger there, there's hurt there. And we're hanging on to those. Satan is really having a rite of passage to harass us. And that's why there are many of these emotional problems that, that may be in our life that we're dealing with. And so I'll command at that point, see the door shut, they've forgiven who's hurt them. And Satan has no right. I command any spirit of depression, sadness, heaviness, whatever, depart, whatever they've been struggling with. You have authority over anything Satan tries to bring in your life. In Christ, we have that. Then I thank God for the fruit of the Spirit. There's some other principles here of that prayer. I won't get totally into it. I will share this one experience. I've... Um, one, one weekend, I was actually down in Texas giving a series, and um, there was a lady there. This was her first time in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. She tried to commit suicide with a drug overdose two weeks before. 
She'd severe, suffered severe abuse in the past. At 12 years old, she was sexually abused by a stepfather. Her mother blamed her. Um, she had been living a lifestyle of drugs, alcohol, immorality. She heard these principles. She came for prayer. Sometimes the deliverance is so powerful. You see it before your very eyes. It did with her. A couple weeks later, she wrote, and by the way, I'm always hesitant to read this, but when I read this, please know it's not me, it's the Lord, 100%. She wrote, Pastor Smith, through your ministry, I've truly been blessed. Here's the important part. My life has made a 180-degree turn. Two weeks before, she tried to kill herself on drugs. I'm finally, for the first time in my life, happy and excited about Jesus and the blessings of the Holy Spirit. It's real. Now remember, what I've shared today, if, if we're in, wherever we're at on this, this latter stage of growth, doesn't mean we're lost. But God wants us to experience the fullness of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. That's the kind of life the Lord wants us to have. I often ask this question, I have in many places in the world. How many of you never heard your father say, I love you? How many of you, raise your hand, never heard your father say, I love you? Yeah. I never did. I had a good father. It was always a handshake. Now, I know his background. He was in an orphanage at eight. He ran away. With another, there's a lot of things there. I understand that. I'd go off to college. It's a handshake. I'd come back. There's a handshake. It's so important that we hear love and we experience love growing up and even now. The church should be the most loving place on earth. That's the kind of congregation <laughs> he wants us to be. And by God's grace, I can tell you, by God's grace, he's, he's working on all of us. <laughs> he's getting us there. You know, it's important to remember God's attitude toward you. Here's some scriptures you, you know. For I know the plans I have for you, desires the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Zephaniah, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. Do you realize this right now? Your heavenly Father is taking delight in you right now. Don't listen to the lie of Satan. Your heavenly Father delights in you right now. He will quiet you with his love. Are you going through something intense and stressful? Remember his love for you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. <laughs> Do you know that? Your heavenly Father rejoices over you with singing. He takes delight in you. I ran across this some years ago. Here's God speaking to you. My son, my daughter, I love you. You are precious to me. You are worth the life of Jesus to me. I am proud to call you my son and my daughter. Let me wrap my arms around you and love you. You are secure in me. No one can shake my love for you or your destiny which I have planned for you. I was reading Christ's prayer one time in John 17, verse 23. And in that prayer, Jesus says, in John 17, the Father loves you as much as he loves the Son. 
you know that? Your heavenly Father loves you just as much as he loves Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that we'll ask God. And I encourage you to do that, not necessarily every day, but as God brings to your mind, to cast down any strongholds that's in your life. And I pray that too, that we will truly come to know God's love for us. And when that happens, our personal walk with the Lord will just blossom more than we can imagine. And also our love for one another will grow stronger as well. We will truly become the living, loving body of Jesus Christ, which Christ established the church to become. So I've chosen for our closing song today, <laughs> the wonder of it all. And Ike and I were talking uh, this week. And if there are some that would like to come forward after the church service, after we're dismissed and have a little prayer time, uh, Ike is going to be up front here. And uh, just, you're welcome to. We thought, you know... I think it's good to offer prayer for those who want to come up. No pressure of any kind after our service. So at this time, we'll sing The Wonder of It All, number 75. Shall we stand? There's a swan of sunset and the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me oh the wonder of it all oh the wonder of it all just to think that God Father in heaven, these words certainly express the truth that you who know us best love us most. The wonder that God loves me. Father, you know that it's in our heart to want to know even more deeply of your love for us. You know the wounds that are in our heart that keep that from happening. And each one that wants to join me this morning saying, Lord, I ask that you will cast down every stronghold that's in my life and in my heart that's keeping me from knowing your love for me. If that's your prayer to God, just raise your hand to him. Father, you see our hands, you know our heart's desire. You know what's there, we don't. We thank you for loving us and for accepting us as we are and for the assurance of eternal life we have through Jesus Christ as we are right now. But Lord, we want more. We want to know your love that's so great beyond comprehension for the human mind. 
but we want to know it in the depth of our heart. And Father, we know when we have that experience with you, there will be no more fear, no more worry, no more anxiety. Our faith will not waver under any circumstance. We'll have confidence that every prayer will be answered to be a blessing for us because we know we are asking and trusting in our Heavenly Father who loves us with all his heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Dennis Smith, pastor of the Clearview Seventh Avenue Church. We're located at 19554 North Papaco Drive in Surprise, Arizona. The major focus in our church is of course on Jesus Christ and also on prayer and the Holy Spirit. I find it interesting that when Christ gave us what's called the Lord's Prayer, as part of that prayer, we were to ask the Father that His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's fascinated me for years. And it had a major impact in my life and as a pastor to realize that when God wants something done in this world, it's absolutely essential that we as Christians ask Him to do it. And that gives Him the rite of passage. So in our church here in Surprise, we have as our mission statement to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, and spirit-led. I'd like to invite you to visit us when you're in our area. Our Sabbath school service begins at 9.20 on Saturday morning, and our worship service begins at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Hope to see you then.